we'd open them please to Acts chapter 15. Y'all just love it when I use visual aids. <laughs> Acts chapter 15. We're going to begin at verse 22. This is just water. Got it from home. Nothing fancy. Just plain water. Did you stand to drink some water? Go right ahead. Sure. Just drink away. Just good old timey water. It's in an Arizona pea container, but it's water. Is that good? Well, probably because it's in the tea container. Yeah. But it's just water, but I'll tell you what, I can make it taste better. Look, it's orange. Look, orange, cleaner, and degreaser. The power of orange. Don't you like orange flavor? <laughs> now, if I put just a little bit of this in this great big old container of water, just a little bit, you know, just to spruce it up a little make it taste better. You know, it might clean your pipes. <laughs> Amen. It might clean your pipes. It's cleaner. See, it might just clean up your pipes real good. Boy, I'll tell you what, you you might just never have a better system stirring up real quick. Now, look at that. That water don't hardly look any different than it did, does it? Doesn't hardly look any different. Let me tell you. Hmm. Hmm, I don't know. <laughs> now let's see if she brave enough and wants to drink some water. You want some of this butter? You don't want any of that water? Why? You, why? It has cleaner in it. Yes, it has cleaner in it. No, it's not dangerous. It's orange. It cleans. Your pipes will be, how about you, Mary? Not in the mood, on dot. No, Uncle T, I don't guess she'd care for any. I know Mom wouldn't. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you what. Looks like it's kind of leaking on me. All right. I'm making a point this morning, and I'm going to get to my point here in a second, and I hope I don't forget that I put cleaner in this water. Because <laughs> I'll be just a knucklehead to drink it. <laughs> I'll go home, pour me a glass, and say, Ooh, this stuff tastes funky. Okay. Amen. Acts chapter 15, beginning at verse 22. If you'd stand today in honor of the reading of God's word, then please that the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, surnamed Barsabbas, and Silas, chief men among the brethren. And they wrote letters by them after this manner. The apostles and elders and brethren send greeting unto the brethren which are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia. For as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your soul, saying, You must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. It seemed good to us, being assembled with one accord, to set chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men that have hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have sent therefore Judas and Silas, who shall also tell you the same things by mouth, for it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us, to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that ye abstain from meats offered to idols, and from blood, and from things strangled, and from fornication, from which, if ye keep yourselves, ye shall do well. Fare ye well. So when they were dismissed, they came to Antioch, and when they had gathered the multitude together, they delivered the epistle, which when they had read, they rejoiced for the consolation. 
and Judas and Silas being prophets also themselves, exhorted the brethren with many words and confirmed them. And after they tarried their space, they were let go in peace from the brethren unto the apostles. Notwithstanding, it pleased Silas to abide there still. Paul also and Barnabas continued in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. I want to talk to us this morning on the topic of here, drink this. Here, drink this. Master, we thank you, God, for your word. We thank you, Lord, for the wonderful anointing and presence of the Holy Ghost that we feel in this place today. Lord, as the word of God is about to go forth, we need your anointing more than ever, God, that the hearer might receive and the speaker might speak that which the Spirit would say unto the church this hour, God, help us today to deliver your word faithfully. Help us, God, to deliver it in a manner that will bring forth fruit unto righteousness in the lives of the hearers. Master, today, in the name of Jesus, let this word go out with great power and boldness, both here in this place, over the internet, and on tape. Let everyone that would hear this word today receive from you, for we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated this morning. Amen. The apostles and elders in Jerusalem decided that it was necessary to make clear their position regarding the law of Moses as it related to the Gentile Christians. Many were troubling the non-Jewish Christians with teachings that insisted that they too must observe the Jewish law and observe all the Jewish holy days. The apostles' answer was succinct and poignant. As the greatest enemy of God since the beginning of time has been idolatry. Only those issues directly related to heathen idolatry, listen to me now, children, were to be carried over into the New Testament age. Did you hear me? Some people don't realize this. See, this is the sad thing about when folks read the Bible sometimes, you'll read statements that the Lord is making. And you'll assume he just pulled that out of a hat and he just magically stood there and said, Woohoo, call no man father. Then that's not the case. He said, Call no man father, because in Babylon it was popular for the priests to be called father. That's why Jesus said, Call no man father. He didn't call, he didn't pull that out of the air. And then when the Roman Catholic Church came along years later and began to copy the old Babylonian system, they did exactly what Jesus said not to do. You hear me now? But it's not like he just pulled that out of the air and said, you know, call me my father. The Lord, where did that come from? Oh, I don't know. I just, it just kind of popped into my head. No, he was saying it for a reason. And I want you to understand today that idolatry since the beginning of time has been the greatest enemy of our living God. And it is only matters which are relative to idolatry that the apostles decided were needful to be brought into the New Testament age. That is why when they sent instruction to the Gentile Christians, they sent uh, the instructions that ye abstain from meats offered to idols. And from blood, this was also an idolatrous practice they're referring to. They're not just talking out of their hat, you know. Oh, and abstain from blood. You know, blood. What blood? What are you talking about? Meats offered to idols. And from blood. The blood is related to the meat that's offered to idols. Are you following me now? Okay. He says, and from things strangled which was another practice related to idolatry. You see, the Hebrews, when they sacrificed, they had to sacrifice a very specific way. Do you remember how that was done? They had to cut the throat and drain the blood from the animal. They were not allowed to strangle their animals. But the pagans would strangle their sacrifices. This is why in the New Testament the Apostle said 
These are the things that, from the entire Old Testament law, these are the only things that we believe are essential to carry through into the New Testament. Abstain from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled. Now notice, all three of them so far are relative to idolatry. And then they say, and from fornication. See, here's a word that we have precious little understanding of because most of us growing up in church, you know, fornication amounted to premarital sex, extramarital sex, almost any kind of sex you could ever name or mention, even for married couples if you, if you weren't careful. But that's not what fornication is. That's not what fornication means by a biblical definition. And it's funny because you never hear churches preaching what fornication really is. You know, there's a lot of pretty young girls like this gal right here who have fathers that molest them. And you never hear it mentioned in churches. But incest is fornication. You hear me now? But you don't hear incest mentioned in very many churches, do you? No. They don't even talk about it. They act like it's a non-existent sin, so to speak. But incest falls under the category of fornication. Rape, forced sexual contact, is also falls under the category of fornication. Child molestation falls under the category of fornication. Bestiality. Sexual contact with animals falls under the category of fornication. Sex that is used to generate money or goods or services of some kind otherwise known as prostitution falls under the category of fornication. And any sexual contact or activity that involves religion that is associated with religious beliefs falls under the category of fornication. So what the apostles had said to the church in the earliest days of the church's existence was, we believe that the most important things that you can do relative to the law of Moses are those things which will prevent you from going after idolatry from falling in the way of the pagan idolaters. So their whole emphasis, they didn't go into how you wear your clothes, they didn't go into you need to wear this kind of robe or that kind of garment, and you can't have mixed uh, different types of materials, you know, and you got to have fringes on the bottom of your clothes. They didn't go into all those issues of the law. They took four simple little things out of the entire law and said these are the only four things that are imperative to the New Testament church Jew and Gentile alike that we be concerned with and that we pay attention to now interestingly I want you to know today the Lord was seldom concerned with his people selling themselves out to a false god altogether God really wasn't so much concerned that the people of Israel during their history would just simply go after another God and leave him altogether. No, he was concerned that they would attempt to mix idolatry with the worship of the one true living God. He was concerned that they were going to bring more partners into the marriage bed is what it was. It wasn't that God was concerned that the people of God were going to get up and go and go be with another God. No, he said, don't bring any other gods into our bed. I'm a jealous God. When you serve me, you serve only me. You don't serve me and Baal. You serve me or Baal. You don't serve both. Come on. That's why Jesus said, you cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot serve two masters because it's either one or the other. Come on now. And I want you to know today that uh, even today, many so-called Christian denominations have adopted any number of teachings and traditions which clearly contradict the Word of God and are the byproduct of the mingling of idolatry and worship of the true God. You know that today? You know a lot of churches out there this morning 
have actually got practices and they have all kinds of teachings that are actually the byproduct of mingling. Oh, but Rome says, what can it hurt? So we adopted some pagan practices and Christianized them. What can it hurt? Do you want to drink this water? I just put a little bit of cleaner in it. It doesn't look all that different. Do you want to drink it? We got people going to church every Sunday drinking it up. You hear what I'm saying? Because all it takes is a little bit. The Bible said a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. And they go to church and there are doctrines and practices that they have which are the byproduct of the mingling of idolatry and the old Babylonian system with Christianity. And immediately it becomes polluted. This water to you and I is polluted today, isn't it? You don't want it because it's polluted. But you know, there's a lot of people today that are going to church and claiming to serve God, and yet they're embracing a polluted Christianity. You hear me now? The very things that the Lord said, uh, that the, the apostles said to avoid, they're actually engaging in. Sometimes not so much in the physical sense as it is in the spiritual sense. Throughout the history of the Hebrew people, the apostasy into which the Israelites were constantly falling was that of mixture. They didn't usually reject the worship of Jehovah God or Yahweh, but rather they mixed heathen rites with the worship of the true God. This was the case with the creation and worship of the golden calf in the wilderness. You remember the story? Moses is up in the mountain, remember, with the Lord? And they created a golden calf. Now, a lot of people think, well, see, they were making the golden calf to replace Jehovah God. No, they weren't. They were making a golden calf to mix with their belief in Jehovah God. Because if you read the story, Exodus 32, 1 through 6, you will find it says, when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron, and said unto him, Make us gods which shall go before us, for as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we not what is become of him. And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons, and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. And all the people break off the golden earrings which were in their ears, and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hand, and fashioned it with a graving tool, after he had made it a molten calf and they said these be thy gods plural he only made one golden calf these be thy gods O Israel which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt and when Aaron saw it he built an altar before it and Aaron made proclamation and said listen to me now tomorrow is a feast to the Lord The English word Lord that we have here comes from the Hebrew word Jehovah. So he was saying, we're going to have a feast to Jehovah God in the presence of this molten calf. Now how do you like that? So the sin of the people of Israel was seldom that they would leave God and go after false gods. No, what they would do is they would bring other gods into the picture. They'd bring other gods into the equation. And I'm going somewhere with this this morning. In Amos chapter 5, listen to what the word of the Lord tells us about the Israeli people as they traveled through the wilderness toward the promised land. Amos 5, 21 through 26, I hate, I despise your feast days. This is God speaking. And I will not smell in your solemn assemblies. Though ye offer me burnt offerings and your meat offerings, I will not accept them. Neither will I regard the peace offerings of your fat beasts. Take thou away from me the noise of thy songs. For I will not hear the melody of thy vials. But let judgment run down as waters, and righteousness as a mighty stream. Have ye offered unto me sacrifices and offerings in the wilderness forty years, O house of Israel? Now listen. 
but ye have borne the tabernacle of your Moloch and chime your images the star of your God which ye made to yourselves so the Lord is saying you're offering me sacrifices and you're singing songs to me and all the while while you're traveling through the wilderness you've got folks that are also carrying their idols who are also believing in these other gods because you see Moloch and Chuan are names used to identify the Babylonian sun god Baal and his goddess mother Astarte which the Roman Catholic Church borrowed in creating the deified Mary same thing honey they've taken Christianity and mixed it with idolatry which is the very thing the apostles were telling in our primary text this morning that's the very thing the apostles were trying to avoid we love to get crazy we read the word you know uh, uh, we read the word their fornication and we love to immediately assume that just means premarital sex and extramarital sex and blah, blah. but in reality in our text this morning it specifically spoke of religious sex or idolatrous sex okay so now listen uh, in another period of Jewish history the Hebrews performed secret rituals built high places used divination caused their children to pass through the fire and worshiped the Sun the moon and the stars and as a result of that conduct they were driven from their land and I'm gonna let you read it at home if you will second Kings 17 verses 9 through 18 so you see again they didn't leave God to go after the false God what they did was they brought the false gods and mixed them in with their belief in the true and living God okay during the time of the judges one man went so far as to ask a priest to abide in his house where he would be revered and looked upon and referred to as his father this practice was well known to the Babylonian idolaters in Judges 17 7 through 10 and there was a young man out of Bethlehem Judah of the family of Judah who was a Levite and he sojourned there and the man departed out of the city from Bethlehem Judah to sojourn where he could find a place and he came to Mount Ephraim to the house of Micah as he journeyed and Micah said unto him Whence comest thou? And he said unto him, I am a Levite of Bethlehem, Judah, and I go to sojourn where I may find a place. And Micah said unto him, Dwell with me and be unto me a father and a priest. It's idolatry. That was borrowed from what the Babylonians practiced. When that man spoke those words, he wasn't saying something that had never been heard before. He was saying something that had been commonly heard within the Babylonian system. The priests were referred to as father. But that was something that a, a Jew should never have done. He should have known better. The Roman Catholic organization has fallen into apostasy and utter decay by doing exactly what the apostles were trying to prevent the Gentile church from doing. They have mixed and mingled the so-called Christian faith with so many pagan and idolatrous practices, rituals, and rites that it no longer even remotely resembles the true Christian church. Babylon gave birth to a religion that worshipped a mother goddess. So the Roman church said, no, yeah, we can handle that. We'll just call her Mary. We'll make Mary our mother goddess. She was born perfect without sin. She ascended to heaven like Jesus did. But my Lord and mercy, you pray to her and ask her to get favors from God for you. The Babylonian system gave birth to a religion that had a multitude of gods who were associated with various days, occupations, and various events in life. The Roman Catholic Church said, we'll call them saints. And isn't it funny that just like Babylon, all these saints 
are patrons to a particular occupation, to a particular lost object, you know, a situation in life. Isn't it funny that just identical to the gods of Babylon, Rome has saints that are identical. They have, they're associated with a certain day. They're associated with a certain event. They're associated with a certain uh, type of occupation. They used statues or idols of their pagan deities in worship. They used repetitious prayers. And rosaries. Rosaries have existed long before the Christian church. And relics were all adopted from the pagan Babylon. And they were given a facade that is meant to make it appear Christian, entirely ignoring the clear teaching of the Lord himself. When the Lord says in Matthew 6 verses 5, uh, sorry, 7 and 8. But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. For they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be ye therefore like, not, uh, be ye, uh, excuse, sorry. Be not ye therefore like unto them. For your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. So even though the Lord himself, Mary, clearly said, do not do this. The Roman Catholic Church turned around and did it anyway. But that's not all. Even the pagan office of Pontifex, excuse me, Pontifex Maximus has been applied to the Bishop of Rome. He became known as the Pope which literally translates Father of Fathers. Even though the Lord clearly taught himself, Matthew 23, 9 and 10, and call no man your father upon the earth. He didn't say call no man father who lives near you. He said anywhere on the entire planet don't you call anybody father. Because there is only one that is your father which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. But he that is the greatest among you shall be your servant. And yet today the Pope sits as a king in Rome on a throne. Do you know the word cathedral? Crystal cathedral? What's that other one we got over here? Cathedral of Hope? Do you know what the word cathedral literally translates what it means? It means place of the throne. Do you know why it's called the place of the throne? Because a cathedral is supposed to be where the bishop has his throne. Gee, I'll tell you, I, my Bible tells me that Jesus taught us not to lord over the flock of God. How in the world do you justify having a throne and sitting over God's people like you're some sort of potentate. How do you justify that in light of the teaching of God's word? But listen to this now. Uh, the danger that we face today is simply this. Will we stand true to the worship and service of one true and living God of heaven who has revealed himself to humanity in the person of the man Jesus Christ? Or will we commit the greatest offense in mingling idolatry and paganism with our true faith? So it's one thing to look and say, well, yeah, Rome did that, Rome did that, but what are we doing? Come on now, think about it for a minute. I, I know this message, I'm not screaming and hollering at y'all this morning because this is, a, this is kind of an important message. Believe it or not, this message has a great uh, importance to us. You might understand it better here in a second, but many seem to believe that truth and lies can coexist. That light and darkness can occupy the same room. A lot of folks want to believe that faith and fear can share the same vessel. You hear me now? We want to try to mingle our faith in the one true and living God. We want to try to see if we can't get away with just putting a little bit of cleaner in that water. Not a lot, just a little. Lord, I know it won't hurt your feelings if I just act in unbelief a little. 
Come on now. No, I'm not supposed to act in unbelief. I'm supposed to act in faith. I'm supposed to be a child of God and a person of faith. Therefore, I ought to be acting in faith 24-7, all the way down the line. We cannot allow ourselves to uh, be dissuaded from that because the enemy wants to come in and he wants us to mingle. He wants us to mix a little of that which is contrary to the truth with the truth. Do you hear me now? But if the devil can get you to do that, he'll convince you. Well, you have the right to be emotional about this. You know, this is a big thing for you. You have the right to, to really wear it out and, and be emotional about it. And, and what a, what are you acting in faith? Because if you're letting the devil convince you that you have this right and therefore you can mingle, you can put just a little bit of a cleaner in the water and it's not going to hurt anything wrong. It is going to hurt something. I know a lot of Christian people, seriously, let me tell you, that have lost their miracles with God. When they needed a miracle, they didn't get it. Because why? Because they decided they wanted to play this little game. And they thought, well, you know what, I kind of like the pity that I get when... Come on now. I had a man in my first church. I was pastor in my first church, and there was a man who was a brother to one of my church members. And he was a paraplegic. And he was very involved. That means he was crippled from here down. Couldn't move any of his body except his head, basically. He had had a severe motorcycle accident and a quadriplegic. And his, um, his sister was a member of my church. And David would not come to our church. She kept inviting him. Oh, why don't you come to my church? Why don't you come to my church? Now, this man was head of the Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship International in Connecticut. Oh, that great charismatic organization. Oh, yeah. This man's a man of faith. This man believes God's a healer. This man believes God can do all this. Why wouldn't he come to our church? He said, that crazy pastor of yours won't let me go till I get healed. <laughs> What's wrong with that? See, he heard the reputation of my church was people are getting healed all over the place. And he heard that. And he said, no, I'm not going there. That preacher won't let me go till I get healed. Oh, well, gee, how much better a life it must be to be in a wheelchair and have to blow into a straw to move, you know. Yeah, what a better life. But you see, that man, Uncle T, got so much pity and so much pathos from people. And everybody patted him. Oh, David is so wonderful to be in the condition he's in and to do all that he does. If he got healed, all of a sudden, he'd be like everybody else. So doing what he did wouldn't be any big deal. You think people don't lose out with God because they want to mingle a little bit of the profane with a little bit of the holy? You hear me today? You think people don't lose out with God because they want to mix and mingle just a little bit of what doesn't belong there with what is there? Come on now. People lose out every day, folks. I see people in coffins shouldn't be in coffins. Come on now. I don't care what anybody says. I believe God's a healer. I do. I believe God's a healer. I believe when it's time for you to go home, the Lord will take you home in your sleep. You lay down in your bed. You close your eyes. And you don't wake up on this side of eternity. You wake up on the other side of eternity. I don't believe God needs a cancer. I don't believe God needs a disease. I don't believe God needs a car accident. I don't believe God needs a bus to hit you. I believe that God can take his people home peaceably. Glory to God. And I believe that God's people have faith. We can believe him and Trust him until that very thing happens. I've said, Sister Gillum, bless her heart. Brother Gillum had gone. And uh, I think it was I think it was their daughter, Barbara, who told me, but I can't quite remember now, it's been so long. And she said that her mom missed the husband, you know. And he had been dead for I guess what, close to a year when Sister Gillum passed. Maybe. And Sister Gillum missed her husband. She missed her husband. She said, oh, I just missed JT. He said, I, said, I wish the Lord would take me home. And her daughter says, oh, Mom, don't say that. 
we need you here. She said, honey, you don't need me. She said, y'all are old enough now. Y'all got your own family. She don't need me. said, you don't need me. And uh, so anyway, she says, one day, Barbara went to the house to get her mom. They were going to go shopping. She knocked on the door. Mom didn't answer, so she let herself in with the key. She went into the bedroom, and there was Sister Gillum on her bed. Her eyes closed peacefully, just laying there, asleep in Jesus. Gone on to her reward. No sickness, no disease. Nothing had to happen to send her to glory. God just said, come home, my child. And up she came. Amen. Do you hear what I'm telling you today? See, the devil wants to, he wants God's people to lose out today. He wants us to lose out by making us believe that a little bit won't hurt you, but a little bit will. Come on now. A little bit of unbelief. A little bit of acting like I don't trust God. A little bit of acting like I don't have complete and total and utter confidence in God. Just a little bit won't hurt me. Oh, yes, it will. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. A little bit can wipe you out. We've got to keep our faith solely focused on the Lord. When the doctor walks in and says, you've got cancer, let your answer be, God is still on the throne. Hallelujah to the Lamb. When the doctor comes in and says, you've got six weeks to live, your answer ought to be, so say you. I haven't heard from Jesus yet. Glory to God. When I was laying in the hospital bed some years ago with pneumonia dying, and they wanted to put a tracheotomy in my throat to, to prolong the life support, my Aunt Leslie, who I had asked many years ago to serve as a health proxy for me if I were ever in a position where I couldn't make decisions for myself, she said, they're asking her, we want to do this. Can we do this? She said, Chuck, I didn't know what to do. She said, I didn't know what to say. She said, because it was, I wasn't making a decision for me. I was making it for you. She said, but then I thought, the way I need to answer is the way that CJ would answer. She said, no sooner did that thought come into my mind than Immediately, she said, I kind of sat up in the doctor's chair and I said, let's just wait and see what God does first. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. She said it was almost like I was possessed. She said, I could just feel you in me. She said, I know what you would have said and that's what you would have said. And honey, that is what I would have said. And let me tell you, I'm here today by a miracle. God delivered me and brought And I want you to know, if you'll talk in faith all the time, if you'll act in faith all the time, if you'll walk this way all the time, and not allow yourself to be diluted or polluted, God will not fail you. Right, amen. Hallelujah. God will not fail you. He will not fail you. My Lord, have mercy. Woo, I don't know about you. I guess I finally found my wind, didn't I? <laughs> I'm almost done tonight to this morning. For many of us coming out of false doctrine and deceitful organizations, we still feel the urge to allow old practices, rituals, and beliefs to pollute our understanding of that which we have come to know today as truth. Ooh. I love my grandmother. My Aunt Dorothy spoke of her. It's her sister. And I believe my grandmother is a Christian lady. She's got the Holy Ghost and all that. But I'll tell you what, my, mother's been, uh, my grandmother's been in Pentecost for I don't know how many years, 50 some odd years, almost 60 maybe 60 even, close to 60, and uh, that woman still has concepts in her brain that were born in the Roman Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? 
she still got thoughts in her mind that are right out of the Catholic Church. I'll talk to her sometime and I'll say, oh, good Lord, Eleanor, my word. Honey, why don't you just go run for Pope? Because you still got enough Catholic in you where you could make it, okay? I mean, you know, because folks, I'm telling you, if we're not careful, that's why the Word of God admonishes us. David's example created me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. That's why the Word of God said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. You see, we have got to have a renewal of our mind. We have got to allow God to change our thinking. If you're trying to mingle and mix what you were taught uh, growing up as a Jehovah with what you know today, as a spirit-filled believer, honey, you're going to lose out with God if you mix and mingle what you grew up with as a Mormon with what you know today. As a spirit-filled believer, you're going to lose out with God if you're trying to mix and mingle what you grew up with in the Roman Catholic Church with what you know today. As a Pentecostal believer, you will lose out with God. My Lord, am I okay this morning? Amen. There's only one answer in this equation today. 1 Samuel 7 and 3. And Samuel spake unto all the house of Israel, saying, If ye do return unto the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the strange gods. You hear me now? Put away the strange gods. If it don't belong to Uncle T, then we throw it away. Amen. We don't keep it because it looks cute. I know I sound old-fashioned. Some people say, Brother Mary, you're too conservative for me. I don't believe in Christians having Buddhas in their home. You hear me now? I don't care if they're cute. I don't care if his little tubby belly sitting there with his legs crossed looks cute. He is an idol. He is a false god. You do not bring that into the home of a child of God. Oh, but I have Chinese motif. The Chinese have plenty of furniture. They have plenty of decorations, plenty of pictures, plenty of paintings. You can put them all in your house that you want to, but the Buddha does not belong there. Any more than does the cute little uh, Hindu idols of the woman with 85 arms. <laughs> Doesn't belong in your house. Do you hear me today, children? I'm going to tell you the truth or I'm going to die trying. But I'd be hanged if I'm going to go to my grave and face God in the judgment and not tell the truth. I'm going to tell the truth. He said, and put away your strange gods and prepare your hearts unto the Lord. So you've got, you've got to put some effort into it. God don't just come down and change everything. You've got to put some effort into it. Sometimes, if you're having trouble with it, look up toward heaven and say, God, there's so many things I, I, as a kid I was taught growing up that are contradictory to what I'm trying to believe today. Help to purge it out of my mind. Help to get it out of my spirit. Help to set me free from the bondage of my past because I don't want to mingle. I don't want to mix. I want to serve you and you alone. Hallelujah. Glory to God. He said, prepare your hearts unto the Lord and serve Him only. Only. Mm. And He will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. In closing this morning, Galatians 1, 6 through 9, the Apostle Paul wrote, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. They would pollute the gospel of Christ. Just a little bit won't hurt you. But it's just enough so that it will. Paul said, I'm surprised that y'all are so quickly removed from the gospel of Christ to another gospel. But oh, you know what? It's really not another gospel. It's the same gospel, but they've just polluted it. 
they just perverted it. He listened, listened to what Paul says. He said, but though we, meaning the apostles themselves, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which ye, we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. That's a strong statement. That's a strong statement. Paul said, if they ain't preaching the same message I'm preaching, then they're not preaching the right message, period. I'm proud to say today, I know that I preach the same message Paul and Silas preached. I know I preach the same message that Peter preached at Pentecost. Word for word. Ain't nobody ever going to stand there and tell me I don't preach what the early church preached. Because, honey, I word for word. When I baptize, I use the exact same words Peter used. Amen. Don't tell me. Then Paul goes on to say, As we said before, so say I now again. If any man preach 